it had this kind of secret advantage that you'd have these sort of rows of identical men, often like identical white Swiss men, like all wearing a navy blue suit and you couldn't tell one from the other. And then there'd be me. And so the chances are that like, you know, if you're going to remember somebody, you're going to remember the one person who's different in the room. Welcome back to Series 10 of 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category-defining founders. From purpose-led entrepreneurs to Olympic champions, you'll learn firsthand from today's successful leaders on what it takes to be brilliant, all in just 40 minutes. Next up in our series, we're joined by Catherine Lenson, angel investor, venture partner at Local Globe and founder of Adante Advisory. Catherine spent the formative years of her career at UBS before becoming the first female managing partner at the SoftBank Vision Fund, where she held the role of Chief People Officer leading the HR, ESG, and real estate teams globally. Catherine has such an impressive CV, so I am so excited to learn more about her career and what she's up to now. So, Catherine, welcome to 40 Minute Mentor. How are things? Hi, thank you so much for having me, James. What a pleasure to be here. All is well. Thank you. Oh, so glad to hear that. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to uh, to get you on the podcast. I've heard amazing things and I'm really looking forward to digging into your CV. But before we do that, we'll get you warmed up with some quick fire questions. So please, can you finish these sentences after me? First up, I grew up wanting to be a classical orchestral conductor. Wow, that is a first for the podcast. Tell me a bit more about why. Where did that come from? You told me one sentence, so I'm <laughs> going to stop. But I feel like, I, yeah, I feel like that's like a, a bomb to throw. And then, yeah, I was very musical as a kid and thought about doing it seriously. In all honesty, I probably wasn't quite good enough to kind of scale the heights professionally, but I was kind of on that line where I thought about it. And well, we can talk about a bit later, I guess, about how I dropped the idea because it involved a certain summer internship at UBS and my head being turned kind of in the direction of the city. But yeah, if you'd have asked kind of 16, 17 year old Catherine, that's what she would have said. Wow, that is amazing. Oh, wow. Brilliant. I'm looking forward to hearing about that moment, uh, that kind of sliding doors moment. Um, Thank you for sharing. The last time I was scared was when? I guess we're we're straight into the real. I had to talk to my kids quite unexpectedly about the death of somebody who died very unexpectedly. And so I had one of those kind of parenting moments a couple of weeks ago where, you know, you kind of feel like there should be a handbook for this and there isn't. And I didn't sort of have time to prep. And so I did have a moment of like, is this one of the moments where I screw up my kids forever slash, you know, parent well. We'll have to wait and see what the outcome is. That's the great thing about parenting, isn't it? You sort of, you don't see the outcome for 20 years or so. But yeah, I definitely felt the fear for a minute then. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. And yeah, having had to give similar news to my daughter last year. I think I was probably one of the most nervous and it's just the unknown, isn't it, about how they're going to react at such a a young age. But it is part of life, I guess, and sadly, one of those things we have to do as parents. But thank you for sharing. We're all making up as we go along. Oh my goodness, yes, we are. (laughs) The most memorable day in my career was? When a rogue trader nearly brought UBS down. And I was chief of staff to the head of one of our trading businesses at that time. Not the trading business where the rogue trader actually sat, but we had this extraordinary kind of day of, is it us? What happened? Yeah, extraordinary. One of those days where I can remember every moment of the day. I can remember what I was wearing, where I was. Like All of it is kind of emblazoned. So yeah, that was an extraordinary, extraordinary day. I mean, that again is a first for the podcast. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine what was going through your head at that time. I do remember reading about that, and uh, yeah, stressful beyond belief. I'd imagine that's a really good one. That dates me a little bit because it was rather a long time <laughs> ago now, but that's okay. Uh, you would never know. You would never know. <laughs> My biggest failure to date is. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about failure, but. There's definitely a driving test related episode there, which took me four attempts to pass my driving test. I'm just not sure I can count that. Like that really was a long time ago. I think probably if I'm being honest, it's my inability to stick to different exercise regimes with adequate consistency. So I'm quite good in fits and spurts, but my ability to actually structure my day around exercise in a way that means saying no to work commitments 
that's probably if I'm looking at like lifelong ongoing points of failure that's probably the big one. Oh, I can relate to that I'm sure everyone can it's funny I, I've now consistently play football on Tuesday evenings but I think I've managed to build that consistency in because it's not interfering with work though I really struggle with getting that gym session in or just doing it more so I'm sure a lot of other people will relate to that one for sure finally if there was one thing I could change about entrepreneurship it would be this is the easy one it's a privilege which is open often only to those who have the kind of financial means to take the risk. And we can talk a little bit about this when we talk about kind of my angel portfolio and and how I think about that. You know, if you're going to give up your job, take minimal salary or no salary for a while and put everything you have emotionally and, and, you know, often materially into building a business, often that's something you can only do if you feel like you have a safety net to catch you. And what I'm really interested in is how do we create conditions that those opportunities are open to entrepreneurs from all backgrounds, regardless of whether, you know, they have a a network of people ready to fund a friends and family round and they're off to the races. So that's something we can dig into for sure. Yeah, love that. Love that. Thank you, Catherine. Really interesting to get a glimpse into some of the things in your your backstory, but I'd love to just go a bit deeper. And and I guess before we get into your kind of what you've been up to recently i uh, would love to learn a bit more about the earlier Catherine. what were your earlier years like and maybe a bit more about the start of your career and how your career has developed since yeah well i, I gave you a little snippet with the music earlier Catherine was if not in some kind of geeky music situation to be found with her nose in a book to be honest i was a, a voracious reader I grew up in the wilds of lincolnshire which for anyone who doesn't know is kind of two and a bit hours north of london It's one of the agricultural centers of the country. So if you're eating a parsnip or a Brussels sprout or a cabbage, it's probably come from Lincolnshire. Very flat, very agricultural, beautiful in its own way with its kind of big skies and, you know, large fenlands. Not a place with tons of kind of economic opportunity. Definitely some kind of social challenges in the area. And for me, somewhere that I definitely knew was not going to be home for the future, I went to school there and then uh, was lucky enough to get a place at Cambridge. And I, you know, I knew at the time as I left for Cambridge that I probably wasn't coming back. And my mum says now that the day they dropped me at Cambridge, she said to my dad in the car on the way home, like, you know, that's it, right? You know, she's not coming back. Odd nights here and there, but you know, that's it. And she was right. And so I'm grateful for the start it gave me, but equally grateful to be one of the kind of, you know, small number probably from my background who, yeah, made it to a great university like Cambridge and then made it into a a career in the city, which was not something I ever expected to do, at, at all expected to do. I studied medieval and modern languages, as Cambridge rather grandly calls it, in reality, Italian and French. And I lived abroad for a year, came back stony broke from it, needed a job for the summer and said to my then boyfriend's father, he's now my father-in-law, who worked in the city, right, what can I do that's going to pay properly for the summer? And he said this was 2003. God, I'm really dating myself. And he said, oh, banking internships for sure, they pay a fortune. I really didn't have a a clue about banking or the city and said to him, but uh, it's this massive drop down box. I have no idea what equities is or fixed income or what do I apply for? And he said, listen, you have this thing where like you read people well and you see stuff that's going on in kind of dynamics in a way that other people don't necessarily see, like apply for HR. It's only a summer. See what you think. And I did. And I loved it. I was working with unbelievably smart, interesting people. And actually, I got a bug, despite the fact that I've never kind of wanted to work in the midst of it, I got a bug for the trading floor. And the speed and the dynamic and kind of the buzz that went on. And and in 2003, this was, you know, pre the vast majority of electronic trading. So it really was, you know, a very lively trading floor with ton of activity and people standing up and shouting prices in a way that it's very different today. And so I got the bug. And that was the beginning of a career in in HR, in people roles. In a way, everything I've done has centered around 
teams and individuals and how do you get the most out of them and that's that was the last 20 years wow amazing wow and it all started from uh, you know that conversation i guess that thanks uh, to your father-in-law for the advice and clearly it's been a hugely successful career before we come on to talk about some of the you know the amazing bits what have you found the most challenging part of your career today and in those difficult moments what helped you through them So I think the biggest challenge that I've taken on was definitely the five years that I spent at the SoftBank Vision Fund. And the great thing about SoftBank is that, you know, so much has been written over the past few years that I don't need to tell any war stories because, you know, you've read them all in the Wall Street Journal. But for me, it was a combination of the complexity of the business that we were building very fast, the pace that we were building. You know, we scaled from 20 people to 500 plus in in four years or so. And so it was, you know, at the same time as we were funding other people's startups, we really were building our own, opening offices around the world, you know, with a scale of ambition that was just like nothing else that I'd ever experienced. But also, frankly, with really practical, difficult stuff, like difficult time zone maths with head office in Tokyo and uh, our biggest investment team in San Francisco and London in the middle. Like just the time zone maths is very tricky to make work. So you'd constantly be on calls very, very early in the morning or very, very late at night. Tons of travel. You know, at one point people asked me kind of where I lived and I used to say, well, my clothes and my kids live in London. And that's a little bit how it felt. Like, you know, I'd be on a plane, you know, either east or west at at any point in time, any drop of the hat. I had this epic week where I did, I flew to Tokyo on the Monday. I did Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in Tokyo. Then Wednesday night, I flew to San Francisco. Turns out if you do that, you actually get your Wednesday again. So you do two Wednesdays. Then I did another Wednesday in San Francisco because of the way the time difference works. And then I flew home from San Francisco Thursday night and got back to London. And I did that week and then went, okay, that probably is not to be repeated. And so that was, it was just intense. My kids were young, like my youngest was two when I started at SoftBank. So like the home front was complex. I, I have a husband who is a CEO of a of a big communications business. And so like we're both going at it at a fairly kind of fast pace on the home front. So it was a lot, but it was rewarding and interesting. And the work was just so different in terms of the, the kind of level of freedom and ambition from anything I'd seen before. And, you know, you asked what helped. I had a boss who trusted me totally, who gave me space, who let me figure out how I would get stuff done, even if you know I knew that the pace of stuff to get done would never change and, w- and would be relentless. And that kind of feeling of somebody's got my back and if I need something, he's there, but also kind of nobody's checking up on me. That felt really good, actually. And I think that's probably what made it successful, even if I think five years is probably enough. I think it was, you know, you can only sprint for so long. And I, I think that was probably about as much sprint as I had in me. Yeah, fair enough. Well, it sounds like a, an incredible experience, but absolutely exhausting and probably not sustainable for another five years. But um, yeah, I'm sure just incredible learnings that... Not for me. Fair enough. Well, you were the first female managing partner at SoftBank as Chief People Officer, which is an unbelievable achievement. We have a lot of listeners for the podcast who are doing fantastically well in their careers. And I'm pretty sure there's going to be quite a few that are familiar with that feeling of being the first female in a leadership team. So do you mind just sharing a bit about your experience of that and any advice for anyone that might be in that position at the moment that might be maybe new to the position? I'm sure they'd really appreciate your insight. Yeah, I kind of grew up with in a generation. So I, I started my full time graduate role in 2004. And so I'm part of a generation where actually, more often than not, I've been the only woman at the leadership table. That's really only changed in, in kind of quite recent years. And so that's been my normal. I have to say, it's not all bad. Like I definitely used to feel in banking, I had this kind of secret advantage that you'd have these sort of rows of identical men, often like identical white Swiss men, like all wearing a navy blue suit and you couldn't tell one from the other. And then there'd be me. And so the chances are that like, you know, if you're going to remember somebody, you're going to remember the one person who's different in the room. So I always felt that actually that, that gave me a bit of edge. And I think once I'd lent into the fact that I probably would have a different perspective. And so I'd I'd often sit in meetings thinking, why is nobody asking this? Like, it seems to me that X is like the obvious question to be asking and nobody is asking it. 
once I got over the fact that like, no, it probably wasn't a stupid question. It was just that somehow like a combination of like being female and like coming from a people oriented background, I was seeing something that other people weren't. Then it becomes a superpower because then you're the only person seeing something and you can often ask the question that unlocks the whole thing that other people maybe haven't seen or or wouldn't have got to. And so I've always taken the view that like, at the same time as trying to kind of recruit some friends to that table, I'm going to make the most of it and I'm going to use it to create impact. But I do think that now in a situation, if you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit, I'm sure, about my role at Local Globe, where it's a really, really gender balanced environment. And it's so interesting to feel the difference that like, there's stuff which I used to watch for or be conscious of that like, I just don't think about anymore. So, you know, for example, if there were a couple of us in, you know, two women in an otherwise male dominated meeting, I'd never let us sit next to each other because I'd always think like, no, no, absolutely not. Like you got to split yourself up. Otherwise it looks like there's only two of you and you're sticking together. And so like, you know, if a colleague came and sat next to me, I'd shoo them away and be like, no, go over the other side. We can't sit together. You know, I sat at local club the other day thinking like, how funny. I just don't think about like table plan dynamics at all in team meetings there anymore because the team is so diverse and so gender balanced. So, you know, by all means, they say that until you have three women in a boardroom, you can't influence the discussion to the extent that you need to be able to. Like one woman, when you're the only, will never have that impact. And so, yes, bring on no more onlys. But I always made the best out of it. And I, I think in many ways, it probably did help at certain times. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing, Catherine. You now have a really varied portfolio career. Uh, you're an angel investor, founder and CEO of your own beauty consultancy firm. You're a bench partner, or a local globe, as you said. So why did you decide to go down this portfolio route and how have you found it? Because it's obviously a big shift from a crazy, intense, full-time role at SoftBank. So yeah, tell us more about your experiences if you don't mind. Yeah, it's definitely a, a big shift. I think if I'm honest, when I left SoftBank, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do next. I was having some level of kind of identity crisis about was I a, was I an HR person or was I not? I'd broadened out a lot in the end of SoftBank. So by the time I left SoftBank, I was running our ESG setup. We had a couple of early stage funds, which were kind of diversity focused. So they were aiming to get capital into the hands of diverse founders. By the time I left, you know, I was looking after to both of those. And so I sort of had this moment, I think I'm probably still in that moment of, you know, I'd done 20 years of kind of really hardcore people in HR leadership roles. And I'd started to see inside this investment world, which I was finding super fascinating. I was already angel investing. I was taking kind of my skills in picking and assessing founders, and I was applying them from an investment perspective rather than from a, you know, from a pure talent perspective. And so I really felt that I didn't want to kind of go into another big HR job at that time, that I wanted to have this period of broadening. And I actually don't know the answer to, is this a permanent kind of broadening portfolio setup? Or will I at some point go and do a, another, you know, big executive role? And, and what would that look like? I, I don't know the answer to that. And I think it's okay that I don't know the answer to that. I'm trying to kind of give myself the space to be like, no, like you're doing interesting work with interesting people. Like you don't need a plan for the next 20 years. Like the plan will formulate itself. And so it's been fabulous. It's been a level of intellectual freedom that I haven't experienced before. You know, I'm working with between Local Globe, which is kind of my my home base, and then a variety of other clients that I'm working through with through my own firm. I have the, you know, the the kind of joy of seeing different leadership teams at work, not going to the same place every day and seeing the same thing, but really seeing that variety, different challenges, different business, different points in the growth cycle. And so the the feeling of kind of not feeling owned by one big corporate, like I was at UBS for so long, I was there, you know, 14 years, you cut me through, I bled UBS, I woke up in the morning, I was UBS, like that feeling of like, I wake up in the morning, I'm Catherine, and I may apply my skills to different places, but it's up to me kind of how I apply those skills and where, that's felt really liberating for the last, you know, wherever we are, nine months or so. And yeah, I don't know whether this is a a phase or this is forever, but it feels great. Oh, that's so great to hear. And all of those sentiments are so reflective of many conversations that I've had with a number of execs in our network. And it's one of the main reasons we've been such 
advocates for fractional and portfolio careers. We really believe it's the future, not for everyone, but just for a certain group of people that want that freedom and flexibility, want to try new things. And uh, it sounds like it's going incredibly well, which is, is awesome. There are going to be people listening to this that have been thinking about it and maybe haven't taken the plunge yet. So what advice do you have for anyone that's in that position thinking about having a sort of going into a portfolio career? I think we also have a, a duty of care to also share the hardest parts of that switch and the role. So yeah, tell us a bit about your experience and any advice for anyone listening. Yeah. So I think my advice for sure is to figure out where home base is for you. And what I mean by that is most people do not do a set of roles or a set of kind of assignments, which are all the same size, right? It's very unusual that I'm spending, you know, two hours with this client, two hours with this client. So what's home base? What's the kind of bedrock going to be of your portfolio around which you build everything else? And for me, I'm extraordinarily lucky that that's Local Globe, where I am three days a week. And so that's given me the ability to say, you know, as I go through this transition, that's a kind of point of stability. I know I'm there. I have like work friends. I have an office. I have a base. I know that like when I come into town, I, I have somewhere. And by all means, on top of that, you know, I'm doing interesting things which aren't with Local Globe, but I'm building that around. But for me, certainly in this kind of first year of transition, having that home base has been so important. And I'm super grateful to the team there for helping me see that that probably was something that I that I needed. So that doesn't have to be a, a kind of, you know, a, a big assignment in that way. It could be that actually, you know, you're part of a co-working community and you know that every day you're going to go and you're going to see people and, and you have your community you have your people, maybe it's a peer coaching group that you know you're going to have a kind of, you know, an anchor with. But what's your anchor? What's home base? I think for me, the most challenging part has been my absolute pathological inability to build in any flex to my own schedule. <laughs> and so, you know, I came out of, you know, I described this kind of very intense soft bank experience, kind of thinking, like, maybe I'll find a way of being which creates a bit more flexibility. I knew I was never going to kind of take my foot off the gas. It's not really me, but maybe I would find a way of being which would create more flexibility. Maybe I would build in daily exercise to my schedule. And despite the fact that I know I'm doing it, I am completely unable not to overschedule myself from morning till night, exactly the same as I would if I was working in, in one executive job. And so I, I really, I would say, have failed that test of kind of creating that flexibility and building in sufficient thinking time and kind of, you know, creative time. And so I have to figure out for myself, like, am I just not able? Like, is that like a a feature in, in me that I just can't deal with? Or what are the techniques that I haven't tried to figure out? You know, I have this unique opportunity to build that flexibility in. Why am I not allowing myself to do that? So that for me has has been the challenge. That's super helpful. Thanks for sharing, Catherine. That's, yeah, I'm sure will be very useful for anyone that's going through that thought process at the moment about whether to embrace portfolio careers. I just wanted to take a minute to tell you a bit more about a podcast we think you'll really enjoy. If you're fascinated by the world of entrepreneurship, love hearing the stories of people building amazing businesses, as well as the inside stories of tech companies that go wrong, then try out Startup Europe. This podcast from the team at Sifted covers the biggest news coming out of European tech spotlighting the companies that are winning investment as well as lifting the lid on the scandals hitting major names in the sector. You'll hear punditry from Sifted's journalists and interviews with established names as well as the up-and-comers who are building the companies of the future. If you want to keep up with what's going on in the world of entrepreneurship in Europe then we think you'll love Startup Europe. You joined Local Globe as a venture partner. You mentioned, I mean, I've been to the office. It's an, an incredible group of people. So I can really see the attraction. Uh, we actually just had Yvonne Bagello on the, the podcast on our VC feature series as well. Stop, Yvonne. She's incredible. Yeah, in absolute awe of the quality of people and also the mission behind the business. But I know you're, you're also, I'd love to actually explore just because you've been angel investing for a little while with your husband and invested in some very familiar names for JBM, Ravio, who we partner with, The Lowdown, whose founder Alice Pelton uh, came on Series 9. I'd love to just explore how your angel investing experience has helped you with your move to Local Globe. And actually, what does 
the role of a venture partner involve? I'd love to yeah, explore those two things if you don't mind. Yeah. So the good news is that the thread between it all is actually the same, which is Saul Klein at Local Work. I've been lucky enough to consider Saul a, you know, a mentor for a number of years now through my, my SoftBank period. And anyone who knows Saul will know that all of his thinking is done whilst walking. And so on one of our, our many walks around the, the King's Cross area, you know, he asked whether I would ever consider angel investing, right? As I was talking about kind of SoftBank and the way my role was broadening. And that, you know, I had this kind of this itch to do something in the investing space, but how would I build credibility? Like, how do you make that transition from a people role into an investing role? And he said to me, well, why don't you start angel investing? And I think I had a couple of barriers to that. So first of all, my view was that was something that one might do kind of when semi-retired and extraordinarily wealthy. And I didn't feel like I fitted into either of those categories. I had this view that people were writing these, you know, very large checks. I, I think if you'd have asked me, I'd have probably said people were writing fifty thousand pound plus checks. And you know, when I talk about angel investing, I always want to kind of flag that actually, you know, people are writing angel checks from a thousand pounds upwards. Our checks are, you know, often five thousand pounds, never more than ten thousand pounds. And so, you know, by all means, these are significant sums of money. I'm not suggesting that they're not, but they're also not. 50,000, 100,000 pounds, whatever I thought the, the checks were. And so between Saul's kind of gentle encouragement slash elbowing, he was kind enough to put me on the, the Local Globe Fellows Program, which really gave me a kind of way into to angel investing. Plus understanding that actually this was something that was doable kind of within a kind of financial planning scenario that probably wasn't, you know, 20 years ago. We started. And I think it's one of those things that like once you start, you realize actually, no, I've I have value to add here. Jonathan and I do a double act. And so, you know, for a relatively small check, you get his wealth of expertise in the communications, PR, marketing space. He runs a, a comms firm called called Milltown Partners. And then you get me for all things people, founder coaching, tricky team dynamics. And, and you know, both of us all will jump in on kind of fundraising, coaching and, and connections to investors and things. So we found that actually very flatteringly, quite quickly, that combination of skills and you know, our willingness to roll up our sleeves a little bit meant that we were actually seeing, you know, some amazing deals. And we have now 22 companies in our portfolio. Yeah, you, you mentioned a few who we're extraordinarily proud of and really for us have been an amazing way into understanding the business of investing, which probably then did lead me to, to Local Globe. And then you asked what a venture partner is. And I think the important thing to say on that is there's definitely no industry standard. So a venture partner at SoftBank would look different to Local Globe, would look different to Sequoia. For me, in all honesty, it is extraordinarily flexible and varied at Local Globe. It's a senior pair of hands to point at internal and external things that come up that don't have a kind of obvious home. So, you know, that can be working with LPs can be directly with portfolio companies. It can be working with our community and neighborhood in Summerstown. And you know, you mentioned how socially focused and community focused local group is. And obviously, you know, with the team internally. And so I've looked at stuff around board governance, internal governance. Uh, we're working on, you know, thinking about how you get more capital into the late stage private companies and thinking about how we help the government with their objectives there. Super varied. Like I couldn't begin to put it into a category. But for me, really a wonderful insight into how a venture fund runs and using all the kind of skills that I've built over the last 20 years, but applying them in, in really varied ways. So I don't think that would translate necessarily to venture partner roles elsewhere, but I feel like I'm being given a, a fantastic opportunity to really broaden and to, yeah, to use my brain, to use my skills and to learn a, a business from the inside. So it's been fabulous. Sounds wonderful. And uh, yeah, the double act of yourself and your husband for founders, I can just see is like a, an unbelievable combination that could be incredibly useful. So your portfolio are very lucky. Just coming on to talk about a topic that's very close to both of our hearts, culture, people, talent. You know, you are a real sought after voice on all of these things. You know, you have such a breadth of experience. And I know that's why you've created the kind of portfolio career you have. So you can kind of lean into those. Do you mind telling us a bit more about the Andante advisory business that you've created? Who do you typically work with? And yeah, would love to just find out how it's going. Yeah, thank you. 
Andante means at a walking pace. And it's a term from music. So when you're, you know, you read a piece of music and there's usually a direction at the top, which tells you kind of what the spirit of the piece is. And Andante, as opposed to, you know, an Allegro or a Vivace, which are my kind of much more upbeat, Andante means at a walking pace. And so when I, when I named the company, I had this aspiration that it would reflect a new phase of life where perhaps I wouldn't need to sprint all the time and I would be able to, I'm a, I'm a big walking fan for all of the exercise I don't do walking is what I do do and it would reflect a kind of a, you know a, an ability to take things at a at a kind of sustainable pace it's not clear to me I've accomplished that but anyway that that's where I was going with with the name and it's a boutique consultancy firm still very small operating as trusted partners to both senior executives but also to leading organizations on culture on people on purpose We've worked on a whole range of kind of leadership and team effectiveness topics, often with a coaching element at the heart of it. So really, if I think about the work I've done over the last 20 years and the common thread of what I find most gripping, it's getting under the skin of a leader, subsequently of a leadership team, and really figuring out what motivates that person and what are the challenges that they're trying to overcome. And really, you know, whether that's as a mentor, whether it's kind of in a formal coaching capacity, whether it's an advisor, which is often the work we do with Andante, really trying to make a difference by understanding that leader, that founder, that CEO. And it's often a fairly uncomfortable spot. Like if I think back to where I was most successful as a people leader, it was figuring out, you know, you'd have a CEO or you'd have a kind of head of a business. It's lonely. Like who do you share your your hopes and dreams with at that point? Not your boss because, you know, he or she's paying you. Not your peers because there's a level of competition. Not your direct reports because, you know, you're their boss. And so I've always kind of found myself, whatever I've called myself, whatever my job type has been, I found myself slotting into that role of kind of sounding board, trusted advisor, someone to work through a a challenge with and and figure out a way through. And that's the work I love to do. And that's the the work that I'm beginning to do in in Nandante. I'm really, really enjoying it. Fantastic. And I'd imagine over the years, you've seen some absolutely world-class teams, you know, leaders and teams, but also witnessed a fair share of mistakes, whether that's founder or, or other. I'd love to know from your unique vantage point, what are the components of a successful company culture? And what are some of the most common mistakes you see, particularly founders and leaders making that impacts that culture? So I think I'll answer that with with a story, if I may. And it's not my story. So apologies to Simon Sinek, whose story I'm, I'm about to steal, and he tells it better than me. So maybe go and watch him tell it as well. But he, Simon's a, a kind of keynote speaker and a, an advisor on lots of things, including culture and leadership. And he tells this amazing story about staying in a Four Seasons hotel. And he goes up to the barista and he's a chatty guy, Simon. And so he asks, you know, gets talking to him and talking about the area and wherever he's staying. And then he asks him, how do you feel about your job? And straight away, the barista replies, I absolutely love my job. And so all of a sudden, Simon's interested because not just I like my job, my job's fine, my job pays the bills. I love my job. So he asks the barista, okay, but but what is it about your job that makes you reply? Like That is an emotional reaction you've given me, right? That's not anything else. What is it about your job that makes you respond that way? And the barista tells him that every day he's at work at his station and managers walk past him and ask him, how's it going? And what does he need to be more effective in that moment? What does he need to do his job to be his absolute best ability in that moment, in that day? And not just his manager, any manager, any manager that walks past him stops, interacts with him and asks him what he needs. And so he explains that that's very different. He's got another job down the down the road. I feel like this is in Vegas, this story, and the other jobs at Caesars Palace. But anyway, definitely watch Simon Sinek telling it. He does it better than me. And his other job at Caesars Palace, that's not how his managers interact with him. There, they're looking for him to make mistakes. And whenever he makes a mistake, they call him out on the mistake. So, and he says, so there, guess what? I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't be interacting. I'd have my head down. I'd just be trying to get through my shift. So what's extraordinary about that that story, I think, which is, you know, fairly apocryphal now, is that this is the same 
individual, right? These are not two different hypothetical baristas. This is the same individual who's explaining that he can work in the morning and show up in one way because of the culture that's created around him. And he can work in the afternoon and show up as a totally different employee, human being, you know, member of a community because of the culture that's created around him. And I think that, you know, when we talk about culture and we talk about what it is, it's really no more, no less than that. How do you be the Four Seasons manager in that situation? And what, you know, as a leader, what are those opportunities to have that impact in the way that that barista is describing that that impact? And so I think it's as simple as that, but it's also as complicated as that. So, you know, the, the mistakes that I see people make are assuming that culture is organic and grows on its own. And in fact, in most successful companies, it's hugely deliberate. You know, founders think about the company that they want to grow, and then they create hooks for that culture, whether those are artifacts, ways that meetings are conducted, methods for giving feedback, like all of these things, which are in the DNA of a place, these are the the kind of building blocks on which culture is grown. And it has to be deliberate. It's very, very rare that it just grows up organically into a a world beating culture. And so that question, you know, what are those artifacts? What are those building blocks? And how do you do it? That's the work I love to do. Yeah, that's amazing. And I've definitely, you know, and I think back to some of our best clients, the ones that are able to attract and retain the best talent, it is the ones that are incredibly deliberate about how they're building that culture and and evolving it over time, because that's also a tricky thing to do as you're scaling rapidly. Thank you so much, Catherine. I mean, I'm sad to say we're going to have to wrap up soon, but um, it's been such an enjoyable conversation. And there's so much mentorship in here for our, our audience. But before we do wrap up, I wanted to just talk a bit more about your qualification as the UK's first fair play facilitator which is, I'd imagine, something that not a lot of our listeners will have heard of. So can you tell me a bit more about what it is and who it's for? So Fair Play is a new method, which has actually come out of the US. And so I think we'll hear much more about it in the UK over the next few years. It came out of some work from an extraordinary activist and author called Eve Rodsky. And she really identified an issue which has been much talked about, which is this question of unequal division of domestic responsibilities, where women shoulder the brunt of running a home, whether or not they work outside of the the home. And this is obviously something which is not new. It goes back generations. It's linked to women's position in the workplace over, you know, many, many years. And so this is difficult to fix. We're dealing here with, you know, deep rooted societal stuff. And so it's very difficult to get at. We can understand the issue. And I think many of us do, but it's difficult to practically get at it. And just to spell out the issue here, the issue is that for many of us, and I'm going to use the example of male-female heterosexual partnerships, but obviously it's broader than that. For many of us, we're in partnerships with you know extremely willing partners who say things like, you only had to ask. If only you'd asked, I'd have helped. But there's an assumption that you know when we describe things in that way, in a certain way, the woman is the project manager of the home. It's her job to know what needs doing and when. And then she allocates tasks to her employee. And that employee, by the way, may or may not do those tasks to her satisfaction. And so this setup, which many of us kind of inadvertently found ourselves in after you know a few years of marriage or partnership, this setup creates a, a situation where the woman is carrying, you know, we describe it as the mental load of running the home. And this is a funny topic to be talking about on a, you know, on a professional mentoring podcast, of course, because we don't often get into the, the nitty gritty of, of what it takes to run a home. But of course, the reason why it's important is that we know that the biggest predictor of success in a woman's career is who she chooses to build a life with. And so, of course, this is in fact fundamental to what it means for women to be able to succeed in, in the workplace. And so while a woman is carrying this mental load, and, and we describe it sometimes as the kind of ticker tape that, that runs through her day. So whatever she's doing, she's got this ticker tape of stuff that she knows needs to be doing on the home front, book summer camp, take the car in for a service. While that's the case, it's always going to limit the amount of herself which she can give professionally. And, you know, in the meantime, I often look at, at men in, in the workplace, particularly kind of earlier in my career and think, how great must your life be? You come to work and all you have to do is do your job. Like there's no point of your day where you're worrying about like 
do I have to finish my Akata order? I'm going to lose my slot. Like how lovely. And so fair play is really a method which I think works for couples who want to get at this problem, but also don't quite know how to. And and this was definitely the the case in, in my marriage where, you know, I was definitely carrying the weight of kind of, you know, expectations of generations that had gone before me. And very practically what fair play is, it's a deck of cards. And every card is an activity of something that it takes to run the house. It can be as simple as grocery shopping, doing the dishes. And the concept is that when you take a card, you take full ownership of that card from the beginning to the end. So this is not a situation where your partner says to you, would you mind emptying the dishwasher? Because if you hold the dishwasher card, you know when the dishwasher went on, you know when it will need emptying, and you know that if you don't empty it, it's not going to get emptied. And so the ability when you deal the deck for the woman in the partnership to give away a number of cards, it's not always half the deck, give away a number of cards and know I actually don't need to allocate any mental space to that at all. That is no longer my responsibility. It's going to get done. And frankly, for the guy in the partnership to think like, wow, I own this. Like, if I do not do this, there are consequences. It's not that like I'm doing a favor by doing a job, but I know that if it doesn't get done, somebody's there to have my back. That in the couples that apply it has proven revolutionary revolutionary in terms of their relationship as adults, revolutionary in terms of what that creates of headspace for the woman in the partnership. And so I was thrilled to qualify. I'm the first, but I'm no longer the only. We were talking about onlys. It's an amazing method. I'm delighted to be able to use it in my coaching, particularly with women, often with women around moments of kind of becoming parents. I also use it in a couples coaching scenario. And so I've been delighted to work with couples who are looking for some guidance on how to apply this in in their own relationships and looking for kind of a coaching context to be able to do that. And that's been totally new work for me, you know, really outside of my, my comfort zone, but unbelievably rewarding. I think if you have my husband on, he'd tell you that, that we still work at it. We don't have it perfectly, but wow, are we mindful about it. And that for us has made a, an enormous difference. This is such an important topic and it's, it's probably, it's definitely under, under discussed. I know my wife is, has often said to me, she has thousands of tabs open at any one time. And, you know, I've seen it firsthand. I think it's something that we all have a responsibility to play our part in kind of helping. So what's the one message you'd like to leave our listeners with on this topic? And is there any particular action that we can all take today to lessen the invisible work that women do? So I think Fair Play is a great read. It's an easy, fun read. I would definitely like, if this is ringing bells, and exactly as you say, James, either you're thinking like, ha, like maybe I've got some work to do, or equally, frankly, you're on the other side of thinking, gosh, I, I do in fact create an atmosphere for my husband where, you know, he can't do anything right and where I'm always marking his homework. In either of those situations, I think it's so worth a read. And I think the more we can talk about this stuff in a professional context, the more we can knowledge that actually like unless we get this stuff right of course we will find challenges with women progressing through the workforce at the at the pace that we want them to because they're literally doing two jobs for every you know one job that a man's doing and so i think the more we're having these sort of conversations i think we'll make huge progress but i'm somebody who learns through reading so i'm always going to say start with the book for me it was absolutely eye opening that's amazing. I'm sure there'll be lots of people picking it up and, and giving it a read. It's a really important thing. Thank you for sharing, Catherine. Sadly, we're at an end. We've got three more wrap-up questions for you. You are on 40 Minute Mental, so I have to ask, if you could be mentored by anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I do have a, a little hero, actually. And so for me, that would be an author and podcaster, in fact, called Esther Perel, who's Belgian originally, but works out of New York now. And she's a couples therapist by training. And one of her podcasts takes you kind of inside couples therapy sessions in a marriage. But the one that I love most is where she does that work with founders. And so she applies a kind of therapeutic approach to founder dynamics that aren't working so well and gets under the skin of that work relationship. It's 
absolutely revelatory. You can imagine based on everything I've told you, this is very much kind of the space I love to play in. And she has both an eloquence, but also a, a lightness and a humor with how she does this work, which I can can only hope to, to emulate. The podcast is called How's Work? And she's Esther Perel. And yeah, she for sure is my dream mentor. That's a fantastic one. I'm going to check that out straight after we stop recording. We've told our 40 Minute Mentor community about your appearance on the podcast and they've sent in uh, a few questions. So we're, this is part of a new feature on the series, which is called Question Ro- Roulette. So do you mind picking one, two or three and then you'll get your mystery question? One. Okay. Question one. What currently keeps you up at night? So actually nothing keeps me up at night. I'm blessed as an amazing, amazing sleeper. Like, I don't know what I did to get so lucky on on the sleep front, but I know what the questioner means, which is like, what's the stuff that's actually really bothering you? I think for me, it's always the unknown stuff. So I'm at the moment, like doing a lot of things for the first time. It's the first time I've run my own business. I'm doing some elements of the work I'm doing for the first time, certainly without the kind of umbrella of a big corporate title to go with it. And so there's definitely a reasonable amount of imposter syndrome that creeps in. And so I've, I've had plenty of moments of, I think I should be able to do this, but I haven't actually done it before. And so this is a first. And so those moments that feel like firsts for me probably cause a bit more angst than they should. And then every time I tick one off, it's another one done and that feels great. But there's definitely been quite a few kind of yeah moments of yeah imposter syndrome and, and anxiety around doing things for the first time. Yeah, and that's a very familiar sort of uh, opinion on this podcast and actually throughout my conversation with lots of execs and, and also for myself, so I can completely relate to it. Finally, Catherine, if there's one piece of advice you would like to leave our listeners with today, what would it be? So I, I alluded to it earlier. I told you that, that I was a big walker and that I think most problems get solved by walking. So there is a, there's a Latin quote, which I, I think is, is pretty good on this one. And so, you know, we'll, we'll end back where we started with Geeky Teenage Catherine. The, the quote is Solvator Ambulando. And it means literally it is solved by walking. And I really do think that much of the time I've wasted has been sitting in front of a computer trying to figure something out when pretty much as soon as I, I lace up my trainers and, and kind of pound the pavements, it's solved pretty quickly. So that's mine. Solvator Ambulando. Love that. And as the son of a, a father who was a classics teacher for 40 plus years, uh, he will really appreciate the, <laughs> the quote at, at the end of this podcast. Oh, we could have done a whole Latin <laughs> segment. What a waste. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. I'm, I'm definitely going to make, make sure he checks that out. Catherine, thank you. It's been an absolute joy. Um, love what you stand for. Uh, you've had such a fascinating career and um, I really appreciate you sharing your learnings, wisdom and great mentorship with us today. So have a fantastic rest of the summer and uh, hope to see you in person before too long. Thanks so much for having me. What a pleasure and what a great conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Catherine. That's all from us today, but do make sure you check out the links in the show notes for more on today's 40 Minute Mentor. And if you have any recommendations for future guests, then why don't you drop our head of marketing and 40 Minute Mentor producer Hannah a line on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, and I look forward to seeing you again next week for more pocket-sized mentorship. Mm-hmm.